Well, thank you so much for coming to GSN tonight. Um, it's good to have you here. Obviously, we've been going through the last several weeks uh, a series called What Love Does. And so tonight, I get the fun topic of confrontation. Now, I know in this room, uh, there's one of two people. Uh, there are those who live for confrontation. They love to tell it like they see it. And the other person in this room is the rest of us who try to avoid that person, right? Because we hate confrontation. Uh, well, here's the reality. Uh, we're we're, we're going to be uh, talking uh, about this idea of confrontation and, and, and actually Scripture. Jesus himself uh, gives us um, sort of a... a, a uh, a how-to on confrontation. We are called to it. It is biblical. Um, and so I know those who love confrontation in the room, they're going, woo yeah, see, we are supposed to confront. Uh, those of us who hate it, you know, or, oh, no, I don't, I don't love to confront. Here's the reality is, is uh, wherever you stand on the issue, I think it's going to be somewhere in the middle uh, that Jesus has called us to. And so we're going we're gonna to read through that this evening uh, and, and we're going we're gonna to really, really talk about that. I hope to, to kind of systematically take you through the passage and really just talk about what this idea of confrontation is and how it fits with this idea of what love does. Before we get there, though, I have to start with a, a passage in 1 Corinthians. Uh, Paul puts forth <clears throat> this idea of uh, um, the, the church being the, the body of Christ and how it's supposed to work together. 1 Corinthians 12, 24 through 26 is just what I want to read. Uh, here's what he says. God has combined the members of the body and has given greater honor to the parts that lacked it so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. See, before we get to this idea of confrontation, because, because as we read the passage, you'll see it, it talks about this, if, if, a, if, if a, a brother hurts you, and some people might get hung up on, well, who am I really supposed to confront? But, but I think we need to understand just how interconnected the, the, the church is supposed to be. If one part suffers, if one part is hurting, just one member is being sinned against, then, then the whole body is affected, right? We understand this. This is why I love this illustration that Paul used because this, this, this human body, this, this uh, structure that, that we live in, right, we understand how this works. If I'm trying to hammer a nail in and I hit my thumb, my whole body responds to that. It might be my thumb that feels it, but man, I'm dancing, my face is changing, I'm, I'm doing all kinds of stuff because my whole body is into the pain that my thumb feels. And so that's how we're supposed to be connected as a church. When one member, just one member suffers, all, all of us feel it. So with that as the, the under uh, 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 girding, the, the, the foundation for our passage tonight, let's go ahead and read uh, Matthew 18, 15 through 20. This is where we're going to be tonight. Uh, there should be Bibles uh, on the seats in front of you. If you brought your own, go ahead and, and, and look it up. Here are Jesus' instructions uh, to us specifically about confrontation. Here we go. If your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault just between the two of you. If he listens to you, you have won your brother over. But if he will not listen, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, treat him as you would a pagan or a tax collector. I tell you the truth, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything you ask for, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three come together in my name, there I am with them. Before we start unpacking that, um, I, I need to invite uh, the presence of the Lord here. Um, I, I want God to show up. I want his truth to be unpacked for us this evening. So would you please bow with me in prayer? God, I do want to humbly come before you uh, this evening. and um, God, I just pray that your words would be spoken, that your truth would be presented. Um, that I would be, uh, God, I, I am a willing vessel. I pray that I would be a, a vessel that you can use. 
Um, if not, then God, as I'm up here rambling, I pray that your spirit would just move in and that you would do the speaking in each and every heart and mind in this place. God, use me or, or, or do something despite me. But God, please show up in this place. Make your word come alive. Amen. Well, in my opinion, I think as we come to this, this passage of Scripture, and I've grown up in church a long time, and I've seen, I, I think this, this passage kind of gets misused a bunch. You see, I think some passive-aggressive people, uh, they'll, they'll, they'll read this and they'll go, uh, you know, oh, I, I'm supposed to, if someone's done something wrong, I, I tell them, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, and then I bring two or three people, and then I can bring them to the church. And so they, they just do kind of this quick staccato, uh, you know, get in someone's face and, and, and because they're passive aggressive, right? They don't they don't know how to really really confront someone. They just they 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 build up all the anger. They come at them and and you do this wrong. And if the person goes, what are you talking about? Then they bring someone else. They they team up against them and and then they finally wash their hands of it and they say, that's it. You're the church's problem. And they they throw them under uh, at a pastor. Pastor, you need to fix so and so. <clears throat> uh, I think I think uh, again. Uh, aggressive people have used it way too often to, well, yeah, we're supposed to confront, and they are willing to, like I said, just just say it as they see it, right? Get in people's faces, and, well, the Scriptures told me to confront, and, and, and so we go at it. We're telling people left, right, and center everything they've done wrong. I think many people, when it comes to this passage, get confused about how to treat someone as a pagan or a tax collector, and sometimes people get this, like, scarlet letter stamped on them, and, and they're, they're kicked out of the church. And I don't think that's what this passage is talking about at all. And we'll get there. I'll explain it. I think many have taken the last two verses, and they've, they've uh, kind of just pulled it out of context, and they've said, well, it's a, it's a verse on prayer, right, where two or three people come together. Uh, there Jesus is. What a powerful statement. And, and certainly Jesus uh, can be there and may be there and should be there if two or three Christians are getting together. But I think as we, as we unpack the passage, we'll see uh, while it, while it uh, kind of indirectly talks about prayer. That's not the point. So I'm going to, uh, like I said, attempt to kind of work through this. So to do that, the first point that I really want to address is why love confronts. See, in verse 15, it kind of started off, uh, Jesus said, you know, confront your brother. If he listens to you, you have won your brother over. And I think that is the heart of what Jesus is going for. And I think that shows up, and we've got to kind of work this passage backwards that shows up here at the end, as we get towards the end. You see, Jesus says this, I tell you the truth, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. See, there's this idea, and, and I'm going to start making this argument for you, and I'll back it up scripturally. We'll keep on going here. But right here, I'm going to say, I, I think Jesus wants such a, a, a unity amongst believers. See, he wants, he, he wants this, this confrontation thing to happen so that, that all sin is weeded out. All of us are on the same page. All of us are getting along. We've all won our brothers over. And at the end of this passage, this is what he really wants. He wants us coming together as a crowd, unified, and saying, you know what, God, we have we've decided as a church, we've, we've talked about it, we've prayed about it, and, and, and here are the core things that we're excited about and we want you to help us with. And here's the things that we're not so excited about. And as long as that's biblical, as long as we're all in agreement, we're all unified, then, then there's this like heavenly blessing, right? Jesus says, whatever you bind, I will bind. Whatever you loose, I will loose. Verse 19 takes it one step further. He goes, again, I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything you ask for, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three come together in my name, there I am with them. There am I with them. You see, one thing, and, and, and here it really, really starts to come out, is this idea of unity. One thing that, that Jesus longs for is the unity of the body of Christ. And, and I'll back it up. There's, there's another guy, Paul. He wrote some other passages, Ephesians 4, 1 through 3. Here's what he says. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all loneliness and gentleness, with long suffering bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. That's what Paul's saying. He's saying be patient with one another, kind with one another, be unified. This is hugely important in Scripture. Philippians 2, one of my favorite passages. Man, I hit students with this all the time. 
right? Teens, they're in this developmental stage where, where they're, 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 their brain is just becoming very, very self-centered and, and, and sometimes uh, just huge, great acts of selfishness take place in the teenage body. We've all done it. It's not just that this group of teenagers is just as bad. I am just as guilty when I was a teenager. Man, I was a selfish idiot. And this passage just flies in the face of that. Philippians 2, 1 through 4. Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection in mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. That's hard, right? We need to be living in such a way that, that as we interact with people, we, we view them as better than us. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Time and time and time again, Scripture calls us to unity in the body of Christ. See, and that's what's happening here at the end. Jesus, at the beginning, right, he gave, he gave the, uh, here's how to confront, but here, I believe, is the why. Why do we confront? Because Christ wants us coming together and agreeing on issues. If there is a wayward sinner in our midst and doing a bunch of horrible things, Jesus says, you know what, you need to bring them, you need to, to pull them in, and you've got to confront that sin. You've got to take care of it. We've got to be unified. So here's the deal, and back to the two different kinds of people, right? If we refuse to confront, or if we confront too rigorously, there's not going to be this unity that God has called us to in this church, right? If we just let things go, if we just let, let people who call uh, Christ their Savior, who, who, who name Jesus Christ, uh, and, but they come here, they're Christians, they say it all, right? This, this is, I mean, this is what we're talking about. Someone who comes, and, 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 but, but we let them just kind of live this, this rampant lifestyle of, well, I don't want to do that, I don't want to say that, and, and, and they start giving Jesus a bad name, then, then, then we're messing up the church. We're hurting ourselves. We're only hurting ourselves. We've got to confront them. At the same time, if we come in and, and we're not loving, we're not, we're not all about this idea of unity, we're just about telling the person how wrong they are and, and we love confrontation and I can't wait to tell them off and all this, then I think we're missing something as well. See, we've got to hit this middle road. We've got to figure out why we confront. See, as a parent, maybe here's one way to, to put it for you. As a parent, any parent totally understands this. Confrontation's got to be done the right way. Okay, I've got four kids in my house, and there are days they, they wake up tired, uh, they wake up cranky for whatever reason, and, and they're just at each other's throats, right? Peace is not going to settle in my home if I just sit back as a parent and I let them have at it. They're, they're siblings. Sometimes your best friend is your sibling. Sometimes your worst enemy is your sibling. Right? And they're just going to go at it and they're going to fight. So as a parent, I understand that I've got to confront the issue. If one of my children is saying something mean, if one of my children is doing something mean, if, if one of them is doing something passive aggressive, if, if one of them is just being stubborn and selfish, I as a parent have got to get into that situation. I've got to pull my children aside. I've got to tell them what they're doing wrong. And, and, and I've got to, to lovingly, constructively instruct them. If I don't, then, then the house is just going to be nothing but yelling and screaming all day, no unity, no peace whatsoever, guaranteed. But I also know as a parent that if I don't confront the right way, right, if I come on too hard, if, 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 if the daddy roar comes out, right, they push my buttons and, rah, and I just start yelling at them, and what are you doing, and stop it, and rah, get to your room, and then I just start letting them have it. There still isn't peace in my home. They're not fighting each other anymore, but now there's four different bodies scattered throughout the house crying and screaming because they're scared of daddy. See, confrontation's got to be done the right way. And it's got to be done for the right reason. So because we love, because we want peace and unity 
in the church of God, we confront. That's why we confront. Now we come to our next point, and, and, and we're going to talk about who love confronts. And so now we go back to the beginning of the verse. And right here, if your brother, that's where I'm going to stop. Brother. See, that term over and over throughout Scripture is used as someone who is a Christian. This is someone who has accepted that Jesus Christ has died for their sins. They have, have bought into that. They've, they've accepted Jesus as their Savior. They know for certain that they are going to heaven. Okay, this is not some, someone who's just coming and checking out church. This isn't anyone outside the church who doesn't believe in God, doesn't want to go to church. We're not talking about the, the masses. We're not talking about all of humanity. We're talking about the people who come here and they claim the name of Christ. Brothers and sisters in Christ. In fact, Paul confirms it. There's another passage, 1 Corinthians 5, 9 through 11, where he says this, I wrote to you in my epistle not to keep company with sexually immoral people. Yet I certainly did not mean with the sexually immoral people of this world or with the covetous or extortioners or idolaters. Since then you would need to go out of the world. But now I have written to you to not keep company with anyone named a brother who is sexually immoral or covetous or an idolater or a reviler or a drunkard or an extortionist, not even to eat with such a person. See, Paul's saying, no, no, no. You know what? If someone doesn't claim the name of Christ, if, if, if you know, I mean, the, the, the world the, the, in mass doesn't, doesn't buy into this God thing, doesn't buy into Jesus, right? And, and, and how should we expect them to live like us? I mean, they're, they're going, you know what? Yeah, Jesus, whatever, that's the name of the past. I don't believe in him. They're, they're not claiming Christ. Why should they live as Christ has called them to? We can't expect that of them. Okay, Jesus isn't calling us to get in their faces and tell them all the dirty things that they're doing wrong. That's not the point of confrontation. It's for the people in this room. It's for the people who call Christ their Savior. It's, it's for the church. That's who love confronts. And now we get into the nuts and bolts of how Love confronts. We get to a three-step process. And here's what I'm going to say. First of all, I, I, I do want to, I'm, I'm going to be highly practical for you here. Uh, and, and, I, and I'm going to give you, and I'm going to back it up again with Proverbs and things like that. Just, but but, but I, I want to give you uh, kind of just three steps, three things to think through. Before you, can, before you confront a brother. But before that, I do want to talk about, I, th I think there's two different kinds of sins, right? There's, 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 there's like a blatant sin of someone absolutely did something wrong. And then other times, I think there's, there's maybe uh, something that someone has, has done, and it's, it's not necessarily wrong. You can't point it out, but it has hurt you. Okay, and I think in both instances, it is still okay for you to go and talk to that person. Confrontation is still a thing. And let's talk about how we do that. Here we go. First of all, if your brother sins against you, go and show. Okay, here's where we kind of get down to this idea of there's, there's two different sins, right? I, I think, first of all, you have to be able to point it out scripturally. Uh, I grew up Baptist, loved Baptist. I mean, that was, that was my whole childhood. I, I learned a lot of great things from the Baptist. But I know uh, when it came to music, particularly in the, the 80s, early 90s, man, Baptists had a hard time switching from the organ to the guitar. And I remember, I remember some days, some Sundays, the, the youth would, would be called up and, hey, why don't the youth lead us in worship? And so the drums and the guitar would come out. And I mean, talk about confrontation. And it was all over this devil music, uh, the, the, you know, using guitars and drums. And, uh, and, and, and so I mean, people would just get angry. And at the end of the day, what you have to realize is there's nothing, in, music is music. There is nothing in Scripture calling guitar, a guitar evil, right? And, and so that's the idea is you have to be able to show it. Now, again, if, if this is an issue of, you know what, it's not really an action that they've done. It's not really something that they've done wrong, and there's no biblical thing. It's just a, maybe the way they said something, it hurt my feelings, or, you know what, then that's fine. You can show them what they've done wrong by explaining how you felt, Okay, this isn't a time for you to get in, in their face and, and shake your finger at them and you did, you did, you did. You're not making accusations here. You're simply coming to them and saying, hey, when you said this or when you did this, here's how it made me feel. Could you please not do that again? 
That is perfectly legitimate confrontation. Here's the idea. Proverbs 15.1, I think this first one, is, as we're showing them, hopefully we've got scripture to back us up or we're just sharing our own emotions and feelings, but Proverbs 15.1 gives us a clear guideline. It says, a soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Okay, this isn't the time. You're not accusing. You're simply coming to a brother or a sister and you're laying the case before them of here is what I think you're doing wrong. Remember that the goal is unity. It's unification. You're trying to to win a brother over. Remember, that's the goal. You're not there to make them feel bad about what they've done. That's not it. A second practical advice that I would give you is just listen. Okay, I had to learn this the hard way one time. I was was driving with a student. We We were on our way uh, to, to some event, and, and I had a couple people in my vehicle. He had a couple in his, and and uh, and we were being kind of funny on the on the road. You know, it, n- nothing real dangerous. Just you know, we kind of would keep uh, passing each other, get in front, and and then just kind of let off the gas. Well, he did this one of these times. He went zooming ahead of me, pulled in front, and then I mean, just slammed his brakes. Uh, I, I thought, I mean, man, completely irresponsible, dangerous. What in the world is he doing? My anger level's through the roof, so we finally get to where we're going. I hop out of the car and I go, what are you doing? I mean, I get in his face, I confront him. You know, I'm the pastor letting the student know this was bad. What in the world were you thinking? And, and he goes, he goes I, I'm sorry, right as I got in front of you, the, the speed limit dropped, I panicked, and I, and I just hit my brakes. So I had to recognize, oh, okay, and, and I had missed the speed limit drop. He probably could have braked a little slower. He didn't have to do it as crazy as he did. But at the end of the day, I come out all on fire ready to confront this guy. But once he explains himself, I go, oh, well, there's really nothing to confront, I guess. He didn't do anything wrong. Right? So here's the deal is when we come to people, maybe we have been offended by something. Maybe we see something and we think, ooh, that looks bad. That looks wrong. And we go and talk to them. And once they give us the explanation, maybe there's nothing to confront. Are you ready to listen to what they have to say. Proverbs 18.2 tells us this, a fool has no delight in understanding but expressing his own heart. You see, again, confrontation is about unification. It's not about you coming out and telling them all the things they've done wrong and why you know it's wrong. It's simply presenting the case and then listening. Maybe they come back, maybe all you need is clarification. The third thing I would say is be very, very careful. Be very, very careful with your words when you're confronting a brother or sister about something that you think is sinful. You see, it's easy. It is so easy to say the right thing the wrong way. You may be absolutely right, but if you come in and your words are harsh and love isn't there and it's not about unification, I mean, you're just, blah, 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 just letting them have it, you can still damage the person, even if you're in the right. So be very, very careful. Proverbs 10.19 says this, In the multitude of words, sin is not lacking, but he who restrains his lips is wise. So this is the idea. Think it out very carefully. Prayerfully consider what you're going to say, and and then measure your words. Be very, very careful. Let me give you a good question to ask yourself. And this is key. And I think this will help you with the, the three practical steps that I gave you. I think this will, this will really, really calm you down, uh, especially if you're one of those people who loves to confront. And, and you know what? It may even give you courage if you're one of those people who's afraid to confront. This is the question. Are you confronting because you want to try to save that person from sin? Or are you confronting because you want to prove a point? Okay, if you genuinely care for the person, if you love them, and you see this thing that's, that's, that's bringing a shame to the church, it's probably bringing hurt in their life, all sin at some point was going to damage us. I mean, if you're seeing this, then, then yes, you're going to be compelled by love. And so you're going to do it the right way because now you're coming at it of, man, I really, really want to carefully extract the sin from this person so that my brother or sister can be a better individual when we're done talking. And we can be unified on the same point. We can be working and striving together for the same goal. See, that's what confrontation is about. The second step in this process is, but if he will not listen, take one or two others along. So that's the next point is you bring some people along with you. 
And here I would like to point out the very last word here, witnesses. You see, I think that that is the reason those people are there. Again, oftentimes I think we, 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 we know, you know, oh, this person's doing something wrong and I'm going to gather my, my crowd and we're going we're gonna to confront them together. We're going to present a united front. And I don't think, at least initially, that that's the case. Now, if there is something that is just blatantly sinful that someone is doing and, and somebody else has brought it to your attention and you've known about it and, and, and there's two or three people who agree, then certainly then you, you confront the individual. The, three, the two or three of you. But especially if it's matters of just being offended by someone, they said or did something and your emotions are raw, then you bring someone along and say, hey, can you, can you just help mediate? And you have the conversation again between the two of you with someone there to listen. And here's what's key about having those witnesses. Because at the end of the conversation, they may pull you aside and say, you know what? I think they're right and I think you're wrong. Remember, this is about humility. It's about unification. The witnesses are there to help find that unification. And maybe it's just you being upset about something you don't need to be upset about. Okay, and, and maybe it is a very clear issue, uh, and, and, and at the end of the day, they agree, and, and okay, this is, this is an issue in this person, and we have to confront it. Now, here's what I'm going to say. In both of these first two steps, the one-on-one -on -one and bringing two or three witnesses, I think you do it several times. I think you give the person, again, it's about unification. It's about trying to save this person from a sin, right? So you give them as many opportunities as you possibly can. Now, I understand, and this is where it gets gray, right? I mean, sometimes you may approach someone just once, and their response is so rebellious and so mean and aggravated that you go, okay, there's no point in approaching them a second or third time. But maybe it's just kind of a, maybe, maybe it wasn't so clear. If you approach them and, and there's kind of a, uh, we go back and forth and, and you see some minor change, but not really. And so, and so you, you give them multiple chances. And again, with two or three people, you give them multiple chances. Remember, you love this person. We confront because we love. So we go to someone over and over and over again. And here is where I think the third step finally becomes uh, very, very clear in going to the church. See, if you on your own have gone to this person several times and you've clearly shown them how they're sinning and they're refusing, they're saying, you know what, I don't want to listen to that. And you've brought in witnesses and they've agreed, yes, you're in the right, this person definitely needs to be confronted. And two or three of you now, you, 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 you've sort of pre presented that united front and you're challenging this person scripturally and you're, you're doing everything you can and they're going, I don't want to hear it, I don't want to hear it, I don't want to hear it. That's when you finally... And now it's not just you going to a pastor and saying, hey, pastor, you need to fix so-and-so, right? Now you've got your table of witnesses, two or three of you. You've got, you've got the whole list of here's how many times we've confronted. Here's the verses we've brought to the table. Here is how we have attempted to bring this person back into a right relationship with Christ so that the church of God looks good. And that is finally where you can present him to the church and say, or he or she, they don't want to listen to us. And we're asking for the pastor's authority to weigh in on this issue. I had the, 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 the chance, the opportunity to do this. Uh, there was a, a friend of mine hanging out with him, and he was just really disgruntled with his wife. Uh, decided, you know what, I just want to leave her. There's some, some chicks I found on Facebook. I'm just going to move to Texas. I'm out of here. I'm done. Uh, and, and so I, I confronted him, and I just said, man, I, that is unwise. That is wrong. That's irresponsible. That's, that's just bad and wrong in so, so many ways. And so we talked and talked and talked, found out there was another individual he'd been talking to at the church, kind of saying, and he, well, yeah, you know, Steve told me the same thing. And so I went and ran to Steve, and I said, what do you think? And we talked, and then so the two of us took him out to lunch together and presented our argument as strongly and as scripturally as we could. And brother, this is wrong. This is bad. Please don't do it. This is not good. And at the end of the day, he just said, it's just too much emotional garbage at home. I don't love that woman anymore. I don't want to be with her. And he was committed to leaving. So it's when me and my friend, finally, we just brought it to the church. We brought it to the elders. And we said, here's what you need to know about this individual. And so they weighed in on it. I think they, they did the best they could to, to have some conversations or talk with people who had and, 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 and really tried to deal with it. And I, I think even at one point had written them a letter. I mean, they handled it really well. And, 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 but they, they finally just wrote them a letter and said, you need, you need to stop 
this, this path you're going down, or we're going to have to revoke your membership from the church. We, we can no longer uh, call you a brother or sister in Christ. And I think this is the idea. Well, no, I, I'm getting ahead of myself, sorry. I'm down to the pagan or tax collector. But, but so that's the way the church wanted to handle it. And unfortunately, this individual said, well, that's fine if that's the way the church is going to do it. I'm out of here. Boom, he took off. And at that point, the church, right, they, they did. They, they, they dealt with it. They grabbed all the people who knew him. They did. It wasn't a public, you know, uh, slamming of the man. They just, okay, who knows this man? Let's go around and talk with those people, see what they know is going on, uh, and, and, and we'll, we'll explain the situation that has happened uh, and, and, and explain to them exactly what has is, what is taken place and, and our stance as a church with this individual. It was very well done. And, and, and so that's what it means to bring it to the church. See, out of a deep love and care and concern for this individual, I'm doing everything. I'm bringing in the heavy guns if I need to. I'm bringing in all authority to try to help and stop this man from doing something that is foolish and ultimately going to hurt everyone around him and himself as well. But he refused. And so we have to ask that question, how does love respond? And that's where we're getting here, right? The pagan or tax collector. How does love respond? And, and, and here's where I think so many people get it wrong. See, they, they, they see that and they, it sounds negative. It sounds terrible, right? It is. It's the scarlet letter, just like that, that classic work, that book, right? You, oh, so-and-so did this. You, you stamp them with a scarlet letter. You, you send them out of the church and, and you know, never going to talk to that person again. And stay away. That's not the idea, again, remember that Jesus is talking about unity. Here's the thing. If we're going to understand anything in Scripture, we have to take it in context, and that's what I want to do with this. Right before, verse 14, 18, 14, right before everything I read for you tonight, Jesus finished up the parable of the lost sheep. Right? It's a story of a sheep that gets lost. The shepherd goes out, chases him, brings him back into the fold, and rejoices I found the sheep. I brought him back into the family. He's been restored with everyone else. He's safe. He's alive. He's good. That's what Jesus is celebrating, right? Then he goes into this confrontation thing. Then he ends it with, with what we started with, right? Verses 18, 19, 20, this idea of, of as we come together in unity, there's this, this awesome heavenly blessing that starts to take place. The, the, the context of Scripture as a whole, right, is God chasing a lost people and trying to restore relationship with them. In fact, Christ himself same, came, said, I came to seek and to save those that are lost. See, in this context, in all of this context, see, this is just a few words in one verse, and we, and we take it out, we say, oh, that sounds so negative, yeah, I kicked the person out of the church. That's not the idea. In all of the context of Scripture, God is deeply concerned about restoring people to a right relationship with God. The, the theological reality of someone who has ignored a friend face-to-face -face confronting them, a group of people confronting them multiple times, a church weighing in and saying, man, this is bad. There are going to be repercussions if you do this. A person who has said, you know what? Forget all of that. I don't care what all of you are saying. I don't care that what I'm about to do is not Christ-honoring. I'm just going to throw caution to the wind. I'm going to do whatever I darn well please. Then the theological reality is that person probably was never really saved in the first place. See, that was a, a conversation I got to have with my friend once the, the, the church had weighed in. Once I knew he'd gotten his letter, I took him out one last lunch. And I said, man, please don't do this. And I even asked him at one point, because he, he was just adamant, no, I'm going to do it. My mind is made up. If the church is, is, is going to revoke my membership, what's the point of sticking through with the church and everything? I'm going, man, no, please. And, and, and I finally, I just asked him a question, point blank. I said, man, do you love Jesus? And, oh, yeah, of course I love Jesus. And I had, to, I had to tell him straight up, I said, I don't think you do. You see, Jesus doesn't like this kind of lifestyle. Jesus died to save you from this kind of lifestyle. And, and you're willing just to go out and, and just do it all over again? Forget what Jesus did for me all those years ago on the cross? He said, I, I, don't, I don't see that as a loving action towards your Savior, Jesus Christ. You see, when it comes to Scripture, when it comes to this idea of treating them as a pagan and a tax collector, I think that's what Jesus is challenging is he's saying, you know what? 
if, if they're willing to go through that much confrontation and be unchanged, they probably never knew me in the first place. So you've got to present the gospel. You bring it back to Jesus. Right now they're, 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 now they're like the rest of the world out there. You know what? I'm not going to assume that, that, that I need to hold you accountable to what Christ has called us to. I feel like I just need to preach Jesus at you. You need to understand what salvation is. Your soul desperately needs to be saved. And so this isn't a, a kicking them out of the church. This isn't a, 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 a ignoring them or anything like that. It, it's this idea of I'm going to preach the gospel. I'm going to do what I can to save this person. Confrontation. Here's how I want to wrap it up. Confrontation may be hard to do, but it is a courageous act of love. And it has to be that, an act of love, not something we love to do. It has to be a courageous act of love that we have all been called to. So my challenge to you, who in your mind is popping up? Who are you thinking about? I, I, I want you to prayerfully consider how can I lovingly and courageously approach this person and confront them with a point of view. Let me pray. God, we just pray for your courage <sighs> to confront the way you've called us to. Give us your love as we have these conversations. God, we really, really do want to be a church devoted to drawing people back into a right relationship with you. Help us do this. God, we ask in your name. Amen.